uh, St. Mary and St. Athanasius Church in the Valley. Abuna, welcome. We are so, so happy to have Otsek. Thank you, Abuna, so much for having me. Thank you. Pray for me, Abuna. In the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So uh, I'm hoping that everybody's doing well uh, this week and throughout this whole quarantine. I'm praying that um, I hope that uh, your families are doing well and um, you've gotten kind of the hang of it. Uh, meaning, I know it's not normal, but uh, as as I was reading somewhere, that this is kind of like the new normal and that uh, it's just a process for us to get uh, adjusted. Um, as far as the church is concerned, uh, I know this week is one of the most holy weeks of the year, and we're all um, saddened that we're not in the church. But I believe that, uh, I believe strongly that this could uh, potentially be one of the greatest holy weeks. Like, I mean, from the innovations, from being able to connect to anybody anywhere in the world, for being able to pray and read at your own pace, all of these um, opportunities that we don't really get many times. So um, I'm, I've been trying to look at the bright side through this whole process of, as much as it's been very hard, but um, let's continue to pray for each other and continue to, uh, to strive for that uh, great time. So uh, as you know, uh, in the church, it's been an eventful couple of days. I know we're just um, the eve of Tuesday, but starting from even Saturday, there's been a lot going on as far as what our church has been uh, celebrating and what our Lord has been doing. Uh, yeah, I, we, Saturday, we celebrated Christ raising Lazarus from the dead, as we know, to remind us and to kind of foreshadow not just the resurrection of man, but the resurrection of God himself uh, on, uh, for the resurrection on, on Easter, on uh, Sunday. So within the two resurrections, we have this journey that starts also with um, Palm Sunday, where we chanted from our homes, um, uh, Hosanna, Hosanna many, many times. And the idea of Hosanna means save us. And this year, this concept of save us means a little bit more, right? Like we're always talking about saving us every year during Palm Sunday, but this year we can talk about save us from this virus, this infection, save us from all the financial hardships, save us from our struggles, save us ultimately from our sins. And now we have a responsibility. We've asked God to save us. And this is what this Holy Week is that, uh, there's in the Orthodox Church we have the synergy. We have God's role and we have our role. And what I want to focus on today is what our role is this week, and what it means based on the readings today and last night. So we always talk about Lent being a journey, but Holy Week is another type of journey, a different type of journey that we're walking throughout all the readings. And it's not just the, the week of Christ, what, what Christ did during that week, but our church has incorporated the readings from the Old Testament that align us and kind of guide us throughout the week. So I said we have a responsibility, and the journey is to get to the resurrection. We started at the resurrection with Lazarus and Christ himself saying, I am the resurrection, and we're continuing in this journey towards uh, the resurrection. But what we're going to discuss tonight is how we can take this journey. Because the idea, we call this Bescha week. And Bescha means resurrection or, or Passover, which for us is resurrection. So this idea of doing this journey, it, it's not just a matter of reading. And I want to say it's not just a matter of praying. It's a matter of there's a main theme of this week, which is repentance. And we talk about repentance a lot, and we hear about repentance a lot. But I want to really focus on um, the, the word repentance and what it, where we got it from the readings today. 
So when we're talking about repentance, we're talking about a true metanoia, a true change of way and a change of heart. It's not a matter of asking God to forgive us. That is surface level repentance. What I mean by that is that there's got to be, there's levels or steps in order to take repent, uh, to, to have repentance. And these steps were kind of displayed for us um, in the reading. So today we read the story of the creation. We read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We read the story of the creation and the fall, um, the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. All of these have something in common. The church, in its wisdom, it doesn't kind of uh, put random stories. It's not like somebody said, okay, let's put on Zephaniah or put on Amos and put on uh, Genesis and just kind of like just pick something from the Old Testament or put something from the New. No, it was they were put together to relay the same message, the, the one message. And this message is, that all of these have something in common. And what they have in common is that they didn't live up to what they were supposed to. They didn't live up to what they were supposed to. What do I mean by that? Each of these, for example, creation. When God created man, he created him in his image and likeness. And the goal of man was to always unite with Christ or unite with God live with him, continue to be in unity with him for eternity. And obviously we know what happened there. Man fell. And man left what their potential was supposed to be. The second, we see the story of the fig tree. And we've all heard the story of the fig tree many, many, many times in our life. So we're not going to talk much about it. But what we, what we can see here is that the reason why Christ was so upset we don't see Christ upset many times, but in these, in, in just in this um, day, we see him upset. And this passion that he has is because he saw the fig tree and it was supposed to look like it wasn't doing what it was made for. It wasn't doing what it was made for. And, and we know that he uh, cursed the fig tree. The, the, and lastly, with the temple cleansing of the temple he entered into the temple and what really upset him is that the temple was made for worship it was his father's house like he said but it wasn't used for worship it wasn't used for worship and it wasn't not only wasn't it used for worship it was it turned into something completely different which was or he called it a den of thieves so we're going to talk about what causes this to happen? What allows things to not be the way, it seems, the way they're supposed to be? For example, for us, we were made in his image and likeness. We were baptized, and now we have a purpose. So what makes us stray away and how we can return back to Christ? To me, I think the reason why we we, we kind of walk away from Christ or we turn our backs from Christ or we have this need of repentance is because we don't always know what our potential is. We don't know what it needs to be. In the case of, for example, the Pharisees, they knew this was the temple of God. They knew that, but they didn't want to use it for that only. They were thinking about, okay, well, if we have a bunch of festivals, if we have a, a, so many people are going to be in Jerusalem at this time, let's take advantage. Let's take advantage of that. Sometimes we take advantage of our situation where, for example, God has blessed us with many things, but you know what? Let's keep God at a distance for now. Let me, let me try to benefit myself. And if I do that, then I'll go back to Christ. And Christ here, he, he teaches us that this is a time of true repentance and that and in each of these examples, he was upset to the point where there had to be a change. For example, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. The fig tree was cursed. And the temple, he himself turned the tables 
um, of the money changers in the temple. So now that we kind of have an idea of what the problem is, how do we get back? How do we have true repentance during this week? Because if there's anything that can come out of this week, the, the, the only way to truly get to the cross at the same time celebrate the resurrection is if we ourselves put to death our sins and resurrect with Christ. If not, honestly, then it's just a wasted week during this quarantine. It's just like any other week. It just, we're just having extra Zoom hangouts. We're uh, streaming constantly. So it might not mean anything, but what we're trying to do is get to um, what Christ wants us, uh, where Christ wants us to be. So the first thing that's required in true, full, meaningful repentance is being vulnerable, being vulnerable. And when I was preparing this, I was back and forth about touching this subject because I think being vulnerable is not something we enjoy. It's not something that we feel comfortable doing. I'll give you a silly example. Many times I'll do Zoom, not, I'm not talking about this, where no one has their cameras on. I'm not calling anybody out for not putting their cameras on. Their camera. And many times it's like, Abuna, I look like a mess. I can't, I can't turn on my camera. Abuna, like, I, you, know, you don't want to see me like this. And I'm like, it just it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what, what, where you are in your room. Just put the camera on just so we can interact. And in that same idea, that's what being vulnerable is about with Christ. Because being vulnerable means to, to not hide behind anything anymore, to not hide behind a screen, not hide behind a closed, um, like a, a closed personality, a closed um, uh, faith. What do I mean by this? One example here, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, we talk a lot about the creation and we talk a lot about their sin. But what ended up happening in that story? I'm going to read from uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, then, then this is right after they ate of the, the fruit. It says, then, they, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? So God himself knew what happened. He, he gave them one rule. They disobeyed. And once they ate of this fruit, once they disobeyed God's command, once they sinned, they realized that they were naked. Once they realized that they were naked, their solution to this problem was to take fig leaves, to take fig leaves and sew it and put it on and hide themselves. And every time you kind of see an icon of uh, Adam or, or, or a picture of Adam and Eve, it's always like that they're covered by the trees, right? They're covered barely, but they're still basically naked. But for them, they felt like just by covering a little bit of, they felt naked, they felt exposed, that they were hiding enough from God. And that only happened because they sinned. And God responded to him and said, how do you know that you're naked? What makes you know that you're naked? And that's because sin allows us to feel that we're embarrassed, that we're scared to be exposed. God basically told them, what were you lacking when you were exposed? What were you lacking? The God, the, uh, in Genesis, it says, their eyes were opened. Many times our eyes are opened to everything, but we're blind to our own sin. 
we're blind to um, what it means to be a Christian. It, we're blind to the idea of our own sin that we don't want anybody to, to see it. So we ourselves don't see it. Because for me, if I feel like I've hidden something well enough, then no one else is going to be able to see it. That's what I think. But many times we get exposed. The true meaning of repentance requires us to be vulnerable to God, to expose ourselves and to reveal ourselves in the sense of our inner thoughts, our inner heart, everything from inside, and to let God enter. We'll get into the, God's role in that. But for us, it requires us to allow for that to happen. Anytime Christ talks about the kingdom of God with the disciples, he always brought up children. He says, come as a child. A child was his example of what we need to become in order for us to enter the kingdom of God. Here we see something very interesting. When he talks about being as a, coming in as a child, we always hear about this. Why a child? Because what a child is, the child is innocent. I know many people here are probably like, like, all right, Abuna, like, I don't know about being innocent, but truly the child, even if they mess up, it's out of innocence. They don't know better, unfortunately. And they're trying, they're still exploring, they're still observing the, the world and, and uh, learning step by step. So they're innocent. They're fully dependent on their parents. The child is fully, fully dependent on the parent. Whether we like it or not, the, the child needs us in order for us to help them, to help continue to develop them in the way they, um, they need to, to help them grow, to help them understand. So for us, when we look at, for example, um, uh, as a child, like coming in as a child, we also have to look at what happens to the child when they grow. And we see that the child, when they grow, they depend less on their parents. Like look at, you know, um, many of us, we have older parents who we might not depend on them as much other than maybe babysitting here and there, uh, you know, some, some fatality food when the fast ends, things like that, the important stuff, but we don't end up, depending on them as much as we did when we were younger. We don't depend on them um, for them to, to, to continue to develop us in that same way, maybe in some ways, but not in the same way that as a child depends on his, uh, uh, his parents. So we see here that in order for us to be vulnerable, we have to kind of be like little children. We have to like, allow ourselves to be vulnerable and ask for God to help, to let ourselves, to let him know our needs. When a, when a baby has a need, they let us know. They let us know in every way possible. And we can hear it for, you know, no matter how far you are, you'll hear the child telling you that they're in need and they'll tell you what their need is as they get older, right? So, so we see here that it requires us to be vulnerable. The reason why that's hard is because we don't want to hear what people have to say. Like if I expose my deepest sins, my first thought is, what are people going to think of me? The biggest problem we have with confession among the youth is that people don't want to confess because Abuna is going to look at me differently. But confession is supposed to feel a little bit of that you're vulnerable, that you're exposed, that you feel this guilt, you feel this, um, this un being uncomfortable speaking what the sin is, being uncomfortable in front of uh, the priest, regardless of who you are. 
Um, and that discomfort is because of sin is uncomfortable, um, especially when we are repentant of it, then it becomes very uncomfortable. So we see being, being vulnerable allows us to be so exposed, allows us to be um, kind of naked and, and, and in a sense kind of empty. When we empty ourselves, we, we're, we're, we feel sometimes alone. We see here in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, what God did when after he, he, you know, he talked to them and after he was telling them that he's going to remove them out of the, uh, of the garden, look at what happens here. He says, um, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Once we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, once we allow ourselves to remove the fig leaves, remove the fakeness, remove the, the image that we're putting in front of people and in front of ourselves, most, most importantly, then what God does is he clothes us. He clothes us with a tunic. Same as with um, uh, the, the son in the prodigal son story. When he came back, he was embarrassed. He went, he was begging for the food of the pig. And he was, I always think about the story, what he must have thought about on his way back. And it, the gospel tells us a little bit where it says, he says, I'm going to tell my father that I have sinned against him and against heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called as one of his servants, uh, called his son, make me as one of his servants. And he's thinking about like, okay, well, should I say this? Should I say that? And thinking about how much he's going to apologize and all this stuff. And once his dad saw him from a distance, he saw him vulnerable. He saw him exposed. He saw him in his sin, he saw him dirty. He ran to him, kissed him, and robed him. And, and Christ himself told us this parable to teach us that he will, he will robe us. But if we even go a little bit deeper, what is a tunic of, of skin? A tunic of skin that he robed him with is like the skin of an animal, right? Like where else would there have been been skin. They were eating fruits and vegetables in, in the garden. This was the first sacrifice. So God sacrificed an animal in order to clothe Adam and Eve. And that's throughout the Old Testament, that's where they got the idea of sacrificing animals in order to show us that the true clothing is the ultimate sacrifice, which is Christ on the cross, which we celebrate on Good Friday, um, where he himself was the, the, the lamb and the ultimate sacrifice. So he covers us, but we, he can't cover us if we're not exposing ourselves, if we're not, if we're covered already in our sin. If we're covered, like if, I'm ha if I have a jacket on, no one else is going to put a jacket on me. But if I'm cold, if I admit that I'm cold, if I admit that there's weakness, if I admit that I'm in need, that's where um, I can get help. The second thing is cleaning. So the first thing is being, being vulnerable. The second part of repentance requires us to have a cleansing. Christ here enters the temple and cleanses the temple. He, he didn't just enter the temple and say, okay, everybody got to go. No, he came in and he himself was removing the people. Um, we see this if you look at, if you watch any movie, or any uh, uh, video of um, people um, basically making, uh, talking about this part, whether it was in, if anybody watched the, the Jesus play uh, that was uh, on sight and sound, they did a great job in showing Christ kind of just looking around and being so upset, so upset that he couldn't believe what was happening. And he started moving um, tables and, and kicking people out. And explaining why, explaining that this isn't what it was supposed to be for. He didn't just say, what are you doing? Get out of here. But he said, this is God's house. This is my father's house. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. The Lord was angry at the way the temple was being used. Now, the question is, how do you think Christ feels about our temples? Not the temple that you guys pray in the synagogue or whatever. I'm talking about our own temples, our own um, hearts. What would he say if he saw it? Would he be okay with it? 
are we using it in the right way? Are we using our temples in the right way? And the temple doesn't just mean the heart. It starts with the heart, but it's, all, it's every way we use our bodies. Are we serving? Are we, are we praying? Am I really truly um, uh, going out of my way for others and loving others? Am I truly um, making the effort even when I don't feel like it? Staying up late, waking up early, um, doing my prayers, doing my reading, repenting. Am I really making that effort? We see here, and I mentioned this earlier, the idea of synergy. The temple had a problem. The temple had a problem. But it wasn't going to clean itself. Christ had to come in and clean it. Everything that happens in, uh, that we see uh, in Scripture when it comes to Christ's healing and, and uh, Christ's transforma our transformation in Christ, it requires for two things to happen. It requires Christ, for us to allow Christ in, and for us to do something. For example, throughout Lent, or the second half of Lent, we see the stories of, uh, let, for example, the paralytic. The paralytic man sitting there doing nothing, sitting, waiting. Christ appeared to him, showed up at, at, his, uh, at his feet, and told him, do you want to be made well? And we think about that question, like, come on, like, of course, I'm, I'm in the hospital. I'm waiting in front of the pool. Why, why would you ask me that? But it was a matter of an invitation. He says, do you want to be made well? He's inviting him to act. Take up your bed and walk. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Same thing with the blind man. He could have just spat on the clay, put it in his eyes, and then that, that's it. Christ didn't need the pool, but he wanted him to, to, to take the walk, to, to make the effort, to go take those steps all the way to the pool and back to think about what his life is going to be now. Same thing with even somebody who was dead. Somebody who was dead, Lazarus. He didn't just walk up to Lazarus, touch him, and raise him. He went, stood in front of the tomb, and told people to move the, the, the rock, and told Lazarus to come forth. Like he even asked a dead man to come out. And this is what we need to think about. What is Christ asking me to do in order for me to clean my temple? What sins are in my heart? What sins have I done? What sins am I currently doing in my life that I can't stop? I can't stop. But Christ is asking me to come forth. Christ is asking me to, 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 to rise, take up my bed and walk. Christ is asking me to completely remove that sin, just like he cleansed the temple. I mean, when we think of uh, treating any type of sickness or illness, like we look at, for example, uh, this uh, coronavirus, uh, everybody's, all the scientists and doctors and uh, professionals are looking for ways for cures or for vaccines in order for us to use it. And that's everybody who's talking about, you know, flattening the curve and all this stuff, that's a truly, truly the only way that this is all going to be okay and to avoid anybody getting it is through having the, the cure or vaccine. But in, in, our, in, in Christianity, we don't treat the sign. We treat the underlying cause. And, and I'm sure in, in the medical field, this is um, very similar to that, that they don't, treat, they don't just treat the symptoms if they have the cure and ignore the infection. In this case, for example, in Corona, they're just treating the symptoms constantly until there's a cure. But for us, we have the cure. Christ himself is the cure. So we have to not just treat the symptoms. We can't just treat, uh, we can't just put band-aids on what's going on in our life, but we need the full cure in order for us to be transformed. So the first thing is being vulnerable or um, exposing our sin to, to Christ. The second is um, allowing Christ himself to, in, in repentance to clean us 
and asking him to, to, to do that. And the third way in order to, um, to have a true repentance it requires us to focus on the cross. Repentance requires struggle. And I, and I think um, it's very important for us to keep our mind on the cross. Because repentance is a death. Repentance is a death, but it's also a life. That, that's why even in the action of a matanya, when you go down, we have to come back up. A matanya that you just go down is not a matanya. That's just, you're tired, you're bowing down, you're laying down, we'll call it whatever you want. But um, a, a bow, a matanya is a bow that goes down and we get back up. And this idea of getting back up is the full repentance. So our focus is on the cross. It requires effort. It's not passive. Many times we think repentance is passive. Repentance is, okay, God, help me with this sin. God, be with me here. God, do this. God, I'm struggling with this. No, but repentance requires us to have an active role, to be prayerful, to, to, to look at the cross, to look at the image of Christ, and for us to, be, um, to see what's missing for us to, ha to have that image. When we look at, um, when we think of repentance and looking at the cross and looking at the true resurrection, St. Paul always used an example. St. Paul, I feel like if he was present day, he would use the NBA and the NFL and, and all the sports leagues and all his examples because he's, he used so many things talking about um, uh, athletics. Because he, he knew that athletics required training, athletics required um, like a focus. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 26. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes, who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight not as the one who beats the air. Notice what he's focused on here. Saying a person who's running is running for a, for a reward, running for the medal. He gives the example of running for the crown. This week, we are also running for this crown. What crown are we running for? We're running for the crown that Christ has on his head, the thorn of crown. The, the, the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns, which symbolizes pain, symbolizes struggle, that we, ha we should put that crown on in order for us to have the, the eternal crown. When, whenever we talk about the martyrs, we talk about those who lived their life, ran the race, lived a life worthy of God, and they received a crown. Once they lived this life, they receive, receive the heavenly um, crown. Ironically, uh, when we look at the time that we live in now, the coronavirus, the word corona in Latin means crown. And, and many of us don't look at it as a, obviously a positive thing at all. And um, we pray for uh, the doctors and the nurses who are dealing with this uh, in the front line. And we're also dealing with those who are struggling um, in their families, those who know people who are sick or infected. But at the same time, we can look at this and we look at this as a crown of struggle, a crown of thorn, this crown that, okay, well, we're in this situation. How can we, we know that when Christ put on the crown of thorns, they were, he, he resurrected. We also, he died and resurrected. We also must die to our sins and resurrect with him and we have to we have to uh run for the imperishable crown if we don't have a resurrection on our mind if we don't have the image of christ and the image of the true uh victory of the cross as our goal then there is no repentance then it's just we're doing an action because we're supposed to or somebody told us to or everybody's doing it you know and and this is not 
the herd mentality where everybody is kind of doing that. We got to stay away from that. Um, the herd mentality helps us with certain things, but not when it comes to repentance. Repentance requires us to be vulnerable, requires us to have true 